virtually every time we see some like um, pastor scandal or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's described as a moral failure, even if uh, under the surface it really is like uh, an emotional health issue or spiritual health issue mm-hmm. or whatever. It's a moral failure. And I, I wonder what that is. I wonder what like what that means about how we view it. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the Uncut Podcast. I'm Pastor Luke. I'm Pastor Cameron. And this is the Uncut Podcast, where we have honest, uncut conversations about faith, life, and ministry. So we were just sitting down and we were talking about what we were going to talk about today, and we kind of started talking about what we we're going to talk, talk about, about today. About today. Mm-hmm. So we just decided to turn on the microphones and kind of keep going. So um, picking up from the last episode a little bit, we we're talking about emotional health and really just reflecting on its impact in leadership. Mm-hmm. There's like a couple, there were some podcasts that you and I were listening to, um, that we're talking about the fallout of the lack of emotional health in leadership. And um, there's no shortage of stories in the news of just like a fallout from failed power dynamics gone. Absolutely. Awry. Yeah. Yeah. And that is like, you know, that like when we talk about that, it's often called a moral failure, mm-hmm. which is a good descriptor. Mm-hmm. Um, it's sometimes a spiritual bankruptcy, mm-hmm. um, but it's also an emotional health issue. Like maybe that brings us to what is emotional health? Like, yeah, it's really interesting because <clears throat> I've never realized this before, but I'm just, it's just kind of just hit me is that virtually every virtually every time we see some like um a pastor scandal or whatever yeah 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 it's described as a moral failure it is even if uh, under the surface it really is like uh, an emotional health issue or like a spiritual health issue mm-hmm. or whatever it's a moral failure and I, I wonder what that is. I wonder what like what that means about how we view it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How we view someone's like the downfall of someone in ministry. Like, like let's just say they had a deeply flawed sense of like emotional health, or deeply like a um, like a, a relational inequity, There's the, an inability to be within healthy relationships, mm-hmm. and that produced a lot of like destruction in their ministry Mm -hmm. and then they left the ministry and it's called what a moral failure right right and so what what is the morality the morality of emotion uh or the morality of like the inability to control emotion in a healthy way that's an interesting topic i wonder like Do, do you think that's a do you think that's a convenient way to flatten down the narrative of it all? Because it's easier to judge mm-hmm. a moral failure. Yeah. Well, I think probably it's just become out of convenience a catch-all term for what happens when a pastor didn't want to leave but had to leave. Right. So because you can't really say, oh, they were not good with people. But they weren't. Yeah, but they weren't. But, but that's a moral issue or not? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, we were talking about like what does it mean when we, when we talk about emotional health? What does that even really mean? Yeah. Like what like, is it? Because we, we talked a little bit around it in some vague terms last time. We kind of talked about emotions as messengers of relational need. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of talked about like pursuing that. Mm-hmm. but. What do we mean when we say emotional health? Yeah, because I think sometimes people are gonna they're gonna think that like, oh, um, emotional health means I'm never gonna be I'm, he- I'm if I'm emotionally healthy, just like if I'm physically healthy, I'm never gonna get sick. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So if I'm emotionally healthy, then I'm never gonna experience depression. 
I'm not gonna never gonna be anxious. Never gonna be sad. Never gonna be sad. I'm never gonna be mad. Or maybe even you're you're you're, you're following you're, you're following the middle path, and you're just gonna be not gonna feel anything. Right. Right. Not gonna feel happy or or too happy or too sad. You're just gonna be this kind of like perfectly like super vanilla super vanilla unaffected by everything yeah that's not emotional health i think that's i think emotions the the peaks and valleys of emotion or experiencing the peaks and valleys of emotion Mm -hmm. is a sign of emotional health right not a sign of emotional disease yeah um and so if emotional health is not the absence of emotion or if we're, that's not what we're talking about, that's not what we mean, then what do we mean right. there? Um, and I, I, I think that emotional health, when we talk about emotional health, I think what we talk about, or at least one of the ways that I'm talking about it, is in the realm of like an awareness and a curiosity mm-hmm. about how and why I respond react, feel, think in certain situations. Like, so having a good, if I'm, if I'm emotionally healthy, Mm -hmm. I have a recognition of like, why, why am I getting angry at this thing? Mm -hmm. Or, or even anticipating what my emotional response is going to be to a situation that's coming up yeah and being able to walk into that situation in a way that is i've already been curious about how i'm going to feel Mm -hmm. i'm already aware of how i'm likely to feel given past experience and now i am in the process regulating unhealthy damaging emotions Mm -hmm. in a way that allows me to maintain relational um Good relational boundaries mm-hmm. or good relationships yeah. within that. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going into a, for instance, if I'm going into a meeting and I know either the person or the topic is someone that makes me angry. Yeah. But that my anger, I don't believe that anger is always a bad emotion. Sure. Like you're coming into a meeting and you're going to talk about the Easter bunny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> completely made up scenario. Completely of course. made up scenario. <laughs> right. uh, which yeah. I know, Cameron, you feel a certain way about the Easter Bunny. I do feel a certain way about the Easter Bunny. <laughs> um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, <laughs> See, that's him regulating his emotions. Exactly. Right that's an exact. Exactly. That's a right. great point. Is that. Um, is that if there's something that you're passionate about, you're about to go into a conversation about it, you know how you're likely to respond. But what I'm going to say is, okay, now as a leader or as a pastor, my relationship with you Mm -hmm. or whoever the person is, persons or environment that I'm in, that we're having that conversation, um, that it is important that I maintain a sense of Christ-likeness. Mm-hmm. Kindness, gentleness, love, still can be passionate, still can speak the truth, still can have an opinion, mm-hmm. um, but that I do not allow my emotional reactivity to damage right. the environment or the people around me, mm-hmm. um, or that I'm aware of how my emotions mm-hmm. or my emotional responses to things affect others around me. Yeah. Because that can happen in the reverse. Yes. Too, as it, like with, with we're talking about anger, mm-hmm. right? You don't want to get angry at someone and blow up and ruin right. a relationship or something like that. But it also be as like, okay, what if I'm experiencing an internal emotion that's, that's not serving me well, mm-hmm. I'm super anxious about something? Mm-hmm. I can carry that emotion home and carry around a lot of anxious energy. Mm-hmm. And then it comes out in anxious thoughts and anxious words and anxious actions. Right. And then all of a sudden, what happens to my five kids and my wife? I look at them and they weren't anxious when I wasn't home. But now that they're home, what are they? Well, I'm home and I've got all this anxious stuff. What are they? Now they're anxious. Right. 
Now they're responding to my anxiety with their own anxiety. They're yeah. codependently, uh, they're codependently reacting to my anxiety. Yeah. Well, I mean, just like, uh, how many times have we, you know, I don't know, spilled a coffee of, or spilled a cup of coffee or a cup of tea in my case. Um, tragedy. Um, or like someone's like a good example is like when we just absolutely lose it in our anger when, when someone's, when we're driving mm -hmm. and like somebody does something stupid, like fails to merge properly mm -hmm. and you just go off the handle. Like, are you mm -hmm. actually all that mad about how they merged yep. or are you angry about all the other things that you've just not been dealing with the anger about? Yes. Um, so would you like, you think that a, an awareness and a curiosity about the tendencies of emotional response is a good definition of emotional health. I think so. I mean, so like I, as you were saying, I was like, Oh, this sounds a lot like, um, have you ever read the emotional intelligence book? Uh, it's called emotional intelligence 2.0. I can't remember the authors of it right now. It's it's, probably, I think it's on my shelf, it's like but on I've, our shelves. I've never read it. So the, their quick definition is, is self-awareness, self-management, others' awareness, others' management. So aware of yourself, what you're feeling, what's going on with you, learning to manage and regulate that, awareness of how you are impacting other people and how they're impacting you, and then managing that dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that kind of gets – I think that's a – just another way of saying exactly what you were kind of talking about, like this curiosity of, uh, of what, what it is that we're feeling and, and then kind of, it, it has to have a managing part of it too. I think, I think we have to grow in our capacity to like hold it. Um, because, like there's a lot of people who kind of this is kind of like maybe a stage of people's like when they begin to explore their mental, emotional, spiritual health is they realize, oh, my gosh, I've been not feeling my emotions for a long time. And they start feeling their emotions. But then they're just like, well, I'm angry. And so then they become mm -hmm. privileged in their actions. Right. Because they're like, well, I'm just speaking my truth or I'm right. just living my truth yeah. or I'm. Um, you know, they end up just doing literally anything because, and the justification becomes their, oh, I was triggered. I was upset. Mm -hmm. This like, you know, it becomes this, I was like, well, your awareness of the thing does not mean that you must be dictated by the thing, right? You can go into that other extreme. They just essentially, they move from repressing to overexpressing. Mm -hmm. You have to have that like ability to ability to take the emotion to take the thing mm. hold it even if it's a really big emotion like anger and not let it rule you but like listen to it what's that um what's the message it has for me and then direct it in a god direction in a good direction mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah i like it so then how do we see <laughs> Is there an environment where emotional health does, you don't have to be aware of it? No. Yeah. No, there's I not. can't because I was thinking like, well, okay, my marriage, do I need to be, do I need to be curious about my emotions and yeah. like aware of my emotions and aware of my like responses to emotion? And I, I would say like also, Emotional health, especially in the context of relationships, is also the ability to understand the emotions of those around you, mm -hmm. not just your own. Right. You know, understanding what is going on in my wife's heart. You've got to have that other's awareness. My staff mm -hmm. or my, you know, church or whatever, like to know what's going on or at least yep. to have an idea about what they're experiencing and how, mm -hmm. how, how am I going to respond in the midst of their yep. emotion. Right. Um, I even was like, as you asked that question, is there a space? And I was like, well, what if I'm uh, alone in the house playing video games and eating Cheetos? And I was like, oh, yeah, 
I need to be emotionally aware of that mm-hmm. because like so maybe you're an emotional eater. Right. Right. Like or maybe I'm just like trying I'm I'm playing some video games and I'm just trying to escape from like what I'm feeling or something like that. There's still I still my emotions are still there. And you know, I was I can't remember what book or where but like we feel things before we think things. Yep. Like they like anything anything sensory or anything that happens it gets processed through our brain through the emotional center before it enters into our logical center. Mm-hmm. So we've had an emotional response to what someone has said before we've even understood what they've said. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think we like to think that, no, that's not true. We're just these logical brains on sticks. Mm-hmm. You and I talk about that all the mm-hmm. time. And it's just not true. No. Yeah, it's just not. So how then should we talk about emotional health in regards to leadership? Well, so to go back to, cause I was talking about like, this is like something that has been really just recently brought up in my head. of just like, or I've been learning is that like the ability to hold things to kind of hold a big emotion and not let it rule me. Right. Or not push it away, but learn from it and, and move in a good direction with it is like that is so essential to good leadership because like if say you're leading you're you're leading a staff meeting and we get we sit down and I come in and I've just got an attitude mm-hmm. right I sit down to the staff meeting and I'm just like I'm just like why are we here like this is pointless like I'm just I'm just emotionally vomiting all over the place mm-hmm. you have to figure out how to lead in that mm-hmm. I'm bringing this big emotional energy into the room Mm -hmm. that's going to take the whole staff and everybody down this negative direction. And you've got to figure out a way to hold it because you could just push back equally strong Mm -hmm. and kick me out of the room. Yeah. Which might be the right decision to do in certain circumstances, but probably the best thing to do would be say, Hey Luke, like what's going on? Like Mm -hmm. what happened before you came here? Yeah. And like, let me feel bad mm-hmm. and then even deal with like holding off your own emotions about maybe me being disruptive so that you can navigate it as a leader. Yeah. Like, right. Because so let's talk about what the, what the, what the other options are, right? The other options are, is you can really like in a situation like that, you could, um, let's say that there's, we'll just talk about the extremes of the spectrum. Yeah. You're a person who is, has a really um, forward, almost aggressive um, uh, type of personality. Mm-hmm. You're like you you face things, or you have an av- the other end of the spectrum. You have a really avoidant personality. Yeah. Right. So, if let's say I'm the person over here who is like. Face it, recognize it, face it, call it out, like yep. deal with it head on. Yeah. Right. There is a possibility, like you said, that not recognizing my own emotional, my own emotional tendencies towards mm-hmm. that thing, I can I can not see what's going on inside of you mm-hmm. or stop to see what's going on inside of you. Right. And instead just allow my emotional reaction to how you are. Mm-hmm rule the day and just completely just like bowl in a china shop over top of someone. Right. And it ends up leaving this person, you, in a space of being like, oh, I just got my rear end kicked in. Right. Because I had a bad morning. And now I know that I can't be honest. Right. (laughs) About how I'm feeling with this person because their tendency is just to crush me. Yeah. All right. So that's one spectrum and it ends up damaging this person Mm because I'm not aware that that's my tendency. And I'm like, okay, how do I lead faithfully? How how can I be still, still be forward with this person? Yeah. Without crushing them with my forwardness. Right. And the other side of the spectrum, you can come in Mm -hmm. like just, fit to be tied, looking for a fight, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I I sit on the avoidant side of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. 
and I don't say anything and I try to ignore it. Right. And you're just like continuing to like. You essentially allow me to infect everybody else exactly. with my attitude. Right. So now it becomes not necessarily the, the, my lack of emotional awareness of how that works or what's mm-hmm. going on in the room. It doesn't necessarily affect you, although it does. It does, yeah. But, but now it's affecting because I'm as the leader, I'm not dealing with mm-hmm. what you're experiencing. It's affecting this person. It's affecting this person. It's affecting this person. It's affecting this person. It's affecting the culture of the room. Right. And so now I, no matter what side of the spectrum, right, if there's not an awareness and a curiosity about how I tend to respond and react to things, Mm -hmm. someone else's emotional landscape, then it can be, will be damaging. Yeah. And I would say that like what is, what is pretty clear in, in experience for me is that leaders who have very low emotional IQ or EQ, Mm -hmm. meaning an awareness and a curiosity about their own feelings, emotions, actions, reactions, Mm -hmm. have behind them a trail of broken relationships. Oh, yeah. Just like you look behind them in their life and you just see broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship. And usually the person is like, it's all their fault. Yeah. Without understanding or taking stopping long enough to say, wait a second, I happen to be the common denominator in all those broken relationships. Right. Maybe I should be a little bit more curious about who I am and how I react and how I respond right. and what the the way in which I think and feel and act in really all of life, yeah. all of relationships. I can't remember... I feel like it was one of the speakers that we saw at the Global Leadership Summit or like one of their books or something, but they were talking about like, you have to consider how you affect the people that you walk into a room with. Mm -hmm. Like that is like for so, and I was like, that is such a next level question. That, yeah, that is a very... That, that's a high level leadership question. Right. Is like whether or not you believe it or not, when you walk in a room, the, um, the emotional landscape of your life, you bring it with you. Mm-hmm. And the responsible thing to do is to ask the question how does my presence affect the other people in the room? Yeah. And I, uh, just like you were describing, the person who has that low EQ and has just a absolute like, you know, uh, just a trail of disaster behind them mm-hmm. has no idea yeah. how they affect people when they walk into the room. Or they don't care. Yeah, or they don't care. It becomes a really self-centered view of their leadership is mm-hmm. whatever I'm feeling is the most important relation or the, is the most important yeah. emotion. Whatever I'm experiencing is the most important emotion. And it's on other people to right remain healthy. Yeah. That's the worst. <laughs> It is. <laughs> it is just the worst. It is. Yeah. I, I, and I'm, I'm like, I'm, and I will be the first to admit, like, I, I don't sit here as the, like, as the perfect example of what it means to be an emotionally healthy leader. Sure. Like, I, that's not me. I would say one of the benefits that we have about having a small staff here or a small leadership here, there's like four of us really. Right. Is that uh, we work closely with each other mm-hmm. and we've, we've, you know, you you're here almost three years now. Yep. Right. I've worked with some of my other staff for, you know, going on a decade. Right. You know, and uh, what's really nice, but also like it it means you got to check your heart. Right. Is that they can tell immediately yep. Yep. how you are, who you are, how you're feeling, what you're dealing with when mm-hmm. you walk in a room. Yep. About your posture, your body language, yep. your what you say and what you don't say, how you say what you don't yep. say. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and then we got to figure out how to manage it. Cause sometimes like I've been here and I'm just like, Oh boy, all of us are just loving life right now. Like yep. we are all just bringing like Eeyore energy into this yep. room. And, 
we got to figure a way to shift this. Yeah. Like, do we need all they need to go to like Crown yeah. Street for like some donuts and there's right. some bagels or something? Go and like. So, I mean, I think that there's a benefit. That one, there's a benefit to us knowing that about each other and being yeah. able to see that about each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't always. I, I don't always feel like we. It's necessary necessarily healthy to like say we all come in with Eora energy, being like, oh, we need to do something to cheer us all up. Sure, right. I think right. that there is a that there is a a healthy part of a leadership culture or a staff culture where it's like, um, is we can name it, but not necessarily feel inclined to have right. to fix it. Right, because you got to honor it. Or like, like what I was saying, you got to figure out how to hold it. Yeah. 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 So like I was just sharing with you and Jessica just a little bit ago that I'm, I'm, I'm sad today. Mm-hmm. I've got some sadness for some things going on in my life. And like it would be one thing for like to spew all that with the expectation that now I want you guys to be sad with me. Sure. That's not healthy for you and it's not healthy for me. It does no one any good. Right. right? Right. So, but it would also be terrible, you know, let's stick with Winnie the Pooh for a second. Mm. If you were to come in feeling all Eeyore and I just come in and say, you're all Tigger. I'm all Tigger. <laughs> T-I double gut er. And I just come in and say, well, Cameron, just like look on the bright side of life. Like, yeah. yep. and I was just the, just the bulldoze over you trying to in goodness, even yeah. with positive intention, fix all of your sadness. I'm just like, turn that frown right side round. Yep. What does that do to you? You're like, yeah. oh well, I can't be, yeah. I can't be me here. Right. Yeah. Yep. It it completely. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It um, devaluates. De- yeah. It devalues mm-hmm. what a person is feeling emotionally. Yeah. Um, and as a leader, um, we have to walk really, really tight lines, really, really razor thin lines between yeah. our own emotional states mm-hmm. and the responsibility that we have to lead people to different places than they are right now. Yeah. Um, and so, and understanding what environments you can let more of your own emotional state out mm-hmm. and what environments it's more responsible to hold that back oh, in. Yeah. Right. It's not responsible for me to do what I just did in the office with you and Jessica at the pulpit on Sunday morning. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, that there is a, you know, I, I need to, um, uh, I, I need to be a little bit more uh, guarded or aware of how my emotional mm-hmm. stuff affects the whole. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, we won't go down to that example. Um, but anyways, let's just say, um, I'm curious because we kind of we got a question on the video this mm. past week, mm-hmm. and they were kind of asking, like, is there uh, so many more mental health issues in this modern society um, because God is so much more removed? Um, maybe we don't have the same values or ethics that we once did. Um, have we become more of an individualistic society pushed towards gratification? So I guess like, I'm curious as we're kind of having this conversation is where does explicitly like Christ come into mm-hmm. this? Mm-hmm. And cause we, cause we did talk about that at the beginning. We were talking about like moral failure. Is that emotional mm-hmm. failure or spiritual bankruptcy? Um, is some of this all kind of where does the undercurrent of spirituality mm. blend into emotional health hmm. and leadership? Because the thing is, is that interesting about that question was my initial thought is like, man, actually people who are really religious, at least in my mind and experience, mm-hmm. have a bad track record for emotional health. Agree. And so much of what I feel like I'm trying to do consistently in my ministry, and I think you are too, Mm -hmm. is trying to show the integration between those two things Mm -hmm. and show, like, look, like, acknowledging God and being spiritual and reading the Bible doesn't mean repressing emotions or getting rid of them and showing the harmony of all of those. Mm -hmm. So can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Wow, is that a big topic? Yeah. Um, I agree that, I think, um, I think that there is a vacuum of 
emotional unhealth, Mm -hmm. particularly in evangelical Christian Christendom. Yeah. Um, Probably spurred on by just like the last like evangelical revolution. Um, Which one? The one that started in like 2016 with all the deconstruction? No, or, no, I'm like the one that started like in the 70s with the Jesus okay, movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You the, know? the 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 fallout in of of the seeker sensitive movement. Yes. Modern contemporary church movement. Yeah. Yeah, where everything is convenient, everything is fast, everything is shiny, everything is happy, mm-hmm. everything is well put together and excellent. Um and so if you're not shiny, happy, well put together, excellent, um then you something is wrong with your faith like you what do you mean you're depressed you're going to heaven what is there to be depressed about what do you mean you have problems with anger yeah. aren't you supposed to just love everything and love everyone right there's a there is there there has been a culture i would say like in the last 50 to 60 years of christianity that has like put emotional health on the back burner of faith Mm -hmm. and said it's not as important as just believing right not as important as just having faith and um and the reality is is that we experience faith through our emotions Mm -hmm. like you, you you can't have an emotionless faith yeah you can't have a faith that is that is completely devoid of any of your typical normal emotional processes Mm -hmm. or reactions or responses. And so the two can't be separated. Yeah. Right. And um, I think it's one of the reasons that like Scazzaro's work does hits so many high points in life. You know, he, Pete Scazzaro is a retired pastor Mm -hmm. author now wrote, writes i guess it's a series called emotionally healthy discipleship was the first book i think that he wrote Moti- emotionally healthy spirituality. spirituality spirituality emotionally healthy discipleship was his most recent book okay um, emotionally healthy churches yeah um, so he's got like a small group curriculum and, and they're excellent yeah they're they're, they're incredible yeah. um but um but you know, so I, I think that there has been a, a little bit of a cultural like has kept us stuck um in the denying of <clears throat> emotional things in the mm-hmm. midst of faith um to our detriment. Um but to answer that question or some of the questions that were in it, you know, do I think that the the rise of emotional health or the fall of emotional health or whatever you want is associated with the general loosening of values and morals in society and uh, going from a we us society to a me or I society. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I, I don't, I don't know that I would say that the, change in the landscape of emotional health now is paralleled with or that there's direct correlation with the changes in Mm -hmm. the values and uh, core values or morals or ethics or whatever individualism versus you know um, community Mm -hmm. type of things that's going on the culture i think that It may be an overly simplistic answer, but I don't really think there's too much that's new under the sun. I I agree. You know, in terms of um, why things happen in culture the way that they do, Mm -hmm. I think my the the stand. I have a, even though this is a kind of a loaded term, uh, I have a biblical worldview. Um, You know, and I I I I believe, and I I trace virtually, I trace everything Mm -hmm. back to all of the brokenness that we experience now, even the brokenness of our own emotional processes Mm -hmm. back to the original 
the original act of brokenness and sin. Yep. And I think that we experience a lot of um, dis- emotional disease in our lives because we are experiencing the fallout of sin, mm-hmm. the consequence of sin. The, yeah. um, not necessarily because the culture is changing so much, although those things are kind of one sure. in the same, or at least that there's associations and parallels there. Um, so generally that's what I think about that question, but yeah, no, I, th- I think like there's something, there's something to challenge in that assumption in that, like, is the world getting worse? Um, and yeah, maybe kind of, but I, you know, I was talking with someone. I think just the worseness is changing its environment. Yeah. It's like the character that like the, the window dressing on the worseness of the world is yeah. changing. I don't, we, 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 we well, we we would never get more sinful than we were in the garden. Yeah, yeah. It's not like there's a more sin and a less sin. Right. We are not more sinful than Adam and Eve. They are not less sinful than us. Yeah. Like, it's the sin changes its manifestation. Yeah. But it still remains equally offensive to the holiness of God. Yeah. I was talking with someone and they were, they, they were having this realization. They're like, you know, all of this, like awful things that happen, like, um, like sexual abuse and sex trafficking and stuff like that. And then they were finding out that, oh, this is old. Like, this isn't just new. This has been happening for a long time. Yeah. Just previous generations maybe haven't talked about it publicly. Or talked about it in a different way. Or, or talked about it in a different way. Yeah. Or if you just – if you go backwards in time, you can go back far enough that you can find literature and history and people who were very honest about all of those things happening. There, We just had like a season in – in, you know, maybe a hundred years or so or 200 years where we decided to not talk about it, you know, like we became repressed at some point. Yeah, or thousands of years. Like we hear this yeah. a lot about like um, the way that the world or the way that the culture now is changing their views on sex, mm-hmm. the morality of sex. Right. Like, like, what, like just look at the way that the world has become like, have you ever read the Greeks? <laughs> Right. Like, do you know how sexualized that society was? I mean, no, normative experience of pedophilia. Mm-hmm. Like, that was normal. Right. It, it was not an aberration. Right. It was normal and accepted. Right. It, this is not a new thing. No. We, we are not experiencing a new thing. Yeah. We are experiencing the same old thing yeah. again. Um. But we have very short memories. We do. Um, or we're just not informed. Not, but yeah. Uh, yeah, like the Greek the Greek experience, even in the Roman period, their expressions and practices of sexual things, equally as like yeah. well, disturbing. We, we don't even have to talk about, talk about sexuality. We can just talk about the Roman Colosseum. They, they yeah. used to, you know what they used to do? So they used to take criminals and execute them for entertainment. Yeah. Make them fight lions. Right. And they, were, they weren't even, not even, like criminals is even the nice thing that to say. They used to put people who were just politically unfavorable mm-hmm. and have them fight lions or fight each other. Yep. And people cheered. Yeah, they bought tickets. Right. They filled stadiums. Right. Yeah. So, or, yeah, is it? Are, are we, we worse? Are we worse? <laughs> I don't think we are. Yeah, I don't think we are. I mean, we still have like reality TV where we put emotionally unhealthy people and make them do life in front of a camera. But yeah. Love is um, Blind, The Bachelor, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and we watch it. Right? We do. We eat it up. <laughs> Somebody was telling me like early in reality TV show. I'm, I need to look this up. But early in when reality TVs were new, they had like a game show where they grabbed homeless people and made them compete. In a reality TV show to win money. Wow. Right? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Are, well, are we better? <laughs> yeah. We're not. We're not, really. We're not better. Um, you know, and so, yeah, I think that there is, I think it's unfortunate that sometimes religious language is co-opted 
to cover up spiritual and emotional unhealth. Mm. I I can remember I'm not going to say who this who this pastor was, but if people listening recognize this sermon then wow it's a cuz it's a deep cut of a sermon mm-hmm. but it was a pastor i that was well known i listened to him a lot at one point and i remember listening to this one sermon where he got up on stage and he was complaining to the congregation and he was like he was just he kind of was just like you guys are so stiff necked you guys are so just hard the pastor you guys make my life so difficult I just want to become a bread delivery man, and I just want to deliver bread because the bread won't talk back to me, and the bread won't sin, and the bread will just listen to me. And maybe I'll just preach to the bread because that would be better than preaching to you. And I was a young, younger believer, yeah. mm-hmm. and I remember listening to that sermon. I was like, something feels wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And now I can name what was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> The whole world can name what was wrong in past in in retrospect, but like, yeah, that's not healthy, mm-hmm. right? Getting up there with this sense of like religious authority, mm-hmm. berating people, making them feel bad, yeah, and having this kind of like martyrdom over over serving in the pastorate. Mm-hmm. all covered in this religious language, all covered with sin and righteousness, and and you're a stiff-necked people like the Israelites mm-hmm. in the wilderness, and just like all is this just giant, emotional, unhealthy, and spiritually bankrupt way of being and mm-hmm. leading. And that's awful. Yeah. Emotional disease. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay. Do you have anything else to say on the topic? The <laughs> last word, or is that the last word? I'm, maybe that'll be my last word. I think that's a good. I think that's a good ending point for today. Mm-hmm. Um, good conversation today, though. Yeah, I think that's val- I think it's valuable. Um, say we've talked before about the things, the books that we want to write. Mm-hmm. One of them is around you know, these topics of like church moral failures and emotional health and how to heal from it and how to um, avoid it. Yep. Um, maybe you'll see that book someday out there, Uncut Podcast Audience. Maybe you won't, but we appreciate you listening today, tuning in. Um, as always, if you would share this to wherever you share things, Yep. Instagram, uh, Facebook, TikTok, whatever you use, Twitter, yep. um, X, X, uh, like it, uh, subscribe. That would be great. Be a great encouragement to us. As always, if you have any questions and you want to send them in and see what we would say about them, our text line is 716-207-0507. And uh, we'd be, we would love to see those questions come through. So thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the next episode.